Welcome to the Homegrown at Home concert series for 2022. I'm Stephen Winnick. For many years, the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress has presented the Homegrown concert series featuring the best in folk music and dance from around the world. Now, normally we hold live concerts in Washington, D.C. in the Library of Congress. But in the year 2020, because of the global pandemic, we shifted to producing an online video concert series, which we call homegrown at home. So artists in whatever configuration they can safely play in record a video concert and submit it to us for the series. So now in 2022, this is our third year of homegrown at home concerts. We are still being cautious about bringing audiences together. And so we're doing this by video. We are very happy to have Chao Tian in our series this year, a master of the Chinese hammer dulcimer. And to get some more background and context for our concerts, we interview the performers whenever we can. And so I am here with Chao Tian. And Chao Tian, you've appeared in the series before in one of our Archive Challenge concerts. So welcome back, I should say. Thank you so much, Steve. I'm so glad to be invited to do this um, Library of Congress concert series again. And uh, I, I'm happy to share the music from my hometown Beijing, China, with the audience. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. So one challenge I have in doing these interviews is pronouncing the names of many people and bands from a wide variety of cultures. Um, so I would like it if you would pronounce your own name for us, just so to make sure that I'm not um, making any mistakes. <laughs> Actually, you did a great job. So my name is Chao Tian. So in China, people call me Tian Chao. So we we shape right. the position of the last name and first name. So Chao, mm -hmm. actually pronunciation, just like the Italian greeting word, Chao. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much. So, and in a similar vein, if you could tell us the name of your instrument in Chinese. My instrument is called Yang Qin. It spells with Y-A-N-G-Q-I-N. It's a Chinese version hammer dulcimer. Mm-hmm. And um, you, you've mentioned that your hometown is Beijing, and I know that you started very young in music. So how did you begin your musical journey? What were those first steps? Yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, I started to, to learn this instrument since I was five years old. My neighbor's daughter, who is older than me, was studying it. So my, one day my mom asked, do you want to learn it? I said, I think I was too young to answer that question seriously. So I said, okay. So that's the very beginning of me and Yang Qin. Then my parents found a tutor, a private tutor for me. I received my first award in the Beijing Youth Traditional Instrument Music Competition after eight months of study. I got a huge inspiration from that competition. So um, my parents thought I should keep going on this instrument study. So the whole story. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, were you trained in a particular regional style from Beijing or was it a more national Chinese music? Uh, actually, it's more like national traditional uh, ch Chinese music. That was my main music background. And after, I think at age 14, I went to a music school, a professional like middle school and high school. So I started to study uh, with professional list in the school, then I, uh, I, I also gained some classical music training background in the college as well. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little about those studies at, in, the, in the middle school and the conservatory. Yeah, it's a very uh, competitive admission of the, the, that music school. Only 20, about 20 students get into that school each year. Mm -hmm. to uh, wow. we, we were a class and we have different kind of traditional instruments. I remember we have three dulcimer students in that year. So the lessons we were taught uh, include the Chinese, like very uh, common lessons, like Chinese, Chinese study uh, math, the, uh, like English. And for the music part, we also uh, had music theory, music history, traditional Chinese music, and private lessons like in person study with uh, your mentors of these instruments and also have some ear training, piano as a minor study, 
Mm-hmm. It's very um, diverse courses offered to young kids mm-hmm. in that school. Yeah. Yeah, and then you went on to the conservatory level. Um, yes. And how did things change there? I actually got an immediate uh, admission to the college uh, in 2003, uh, start starting to study in China Conservatory of Music for my um, bachelor degree study for four years. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I, 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 kind, I kind of like that, that time in college. It was very free and I can select uh, a lot of uh, courses that I would love to study, for example, German. <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. know why I picked that <laughs> language study. So uh, I spent four years with my um, uh, professor, uh, Xiang Zuhua, who is a uh, Yangqin master, uh, already passed away uh, two years ago. So we, I think I gained a lot of um, knowledge from him, um, in particularly uh, silk and bamboo music, which mm-hmm. is uh, the popular um, genre from southern China and also I learned a lot uh, in college um, on the on the topic of Nanyin music where mm-hmm. it's from southern China as well but in Fujian province that, that area so a lot of field study uh, tour with the school a lot of purple performances experiences gained during that time mm-hmm. So tell us a little about those two styles, the silk and bamboo and the Nongyin music that you were telling us about. Yeah, so uh, silk and bamboo music are, uh, is originally from uh, Yangtze River, like the Shanghai, er- Shanghai or um, Zhejiang province. That area mm-hmm. is more like southern, southern area. And uh, from my own perspective, I consider silk and bamboo music more like a pop music but in mm-hmm. a traditional way mm-hmm. uh, but Nanyin music is, is a life puzzle of the traditional Chinese music it's very ancient music style has a long long history they are very different they're different in the um, the mode the, the, the tune mode and they, they have different instruments in different ensemble in their ensembles for example the silk and the bamboo music the they normally have dulcimer, Chinese dulcimer, yang qin, mm-hmm. pipa, bamboo flute, uh, what else, uh, arhu as mm-hmm. the main instrument. But in Nanyin music, they have specific instruments, but very different from the that four pieces of instruments. Um, there is a very ancient style of pipa, have called five string pipa, and they used often in the Nanyin ensemble. So. Uh, I got a chance to um, do this field study six years ago and in uh, Quanzhou province, Quanzhou city, actually the city. So mm-hmm. I learned a lot from the local artists and uh, it's very different. I hope I can uh, share more in person with, uh, with the music to the audience to give, their, to give them more brief um, vision about this kind of music. Yeah, I hope, I, I hope that you're able to do that because it sounds like a, a fascinating topic. So I know you also got a musicology degree um, yeah. <laughs> during your studies there. So what did you study for, for that, uh, for the purpose of that degree? So mainly it's about uh, the research in the, the young team performance. Mm-hmm. But my uh, graduate uh, uh, paper, uh, my graduate studies, uh topic is more about the word synesthesia, the synest- like the interaction, um, art interaction between visual art and the Chinese Yangqin music. Because in, in China, what, um, so from my, my family has a very strong uh, arts uh, background. My, my great grandfather, who is a very famous Chinese painter, so, uh, he did the brush painting style. Mm-hmm. So I kind of like inherited a little bit <laughs> from him. So I always fascinated about Chinese brush painting. And I found there is a very strong relationship, uh, connections between brush painting and Chinese traditional music. So we, uh, for example, we, we, we both use uh, some music uh, at, 
music philosophies, Chinese philosophies. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, there's a concept called Liu Bai. It can be translated as um, leave blackness. So mm -hmm. both the artists that you exert this concept, both in painting and music, we leave a lot of blackness, empty space to give mm -hmm. the audience more um, spaces to use their own imagination to um, to think about this art artwork or music. So my my research of my uh, graduate study is more like how how we can apply this uh, concept synesthesia um, between music and arts, especially the Chinese uh, painting arts. Mm -hmm. Well, that that must be a fascinating topic too to just think <laughs> about the connections between the visual side of art. And music, yeah. uh, amazing. So I, I think, I think yeah. it also helped me because now I I improvised a lot. Mm -hmm. So when I improvise music, I think that concept helped me a lot to um, to use the the, the to reference to take some reference from the the paintings and mm -hmm. music playing because there are. A lot of connections. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'll, I will ask you some more musical questions, but one more about your career. Um, could you please talk a little about your teaching and outreach work with uh, Beijing Language and Culture University? Okay. Uh, after graduate from the school, I I got a position uh, in Beijing Language and Culture University as a lecturer, and I also um, very lucky to to be a uh, appointed as a, a director of the Arts Education Center. Uh, during that time, I was super busy, <laughs> arrange all kinds of arts um, activities of the school on campus, uh, on campus and uh, out of the campus as well. And uh, uh, we have a, in the Arts Education Center, we have different kind of uh, student study group, include drama study, um, uh, chorus, student chorus, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, traditional ensemble, um, chamber music, percussion ensemble, uh, and dance group. So mm -hmm. basically all kinds of arts form. So my responsibility is to hire um, teachers for, for those groups to give them lessons, train the students, and uh, um, also organize arts events. And also, uh, we have different international tour with the students to uh, go abroad with different schools. Uh, for example, in Mexico, uh, in in Japan, in Thailand. So basically, like a uh, arts administrator, that's one of my um, important role back to that time. And also, I offered uh, music history lessons in on campus as a um, selective course. I I forgot mm -hmm. the word. So yeah, so so that was a crazy time, but I really enjoyed, and I uh, I love to put my um to use my passion uh, to to do those teaching uh, job, and uh, I enjoy the time spent spend a lot of time with my students. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thanks for <laughs> explaining a little bit about that because it's a it's a something I think most uh, Americans wouldn't know very much about. So um, so now I'll ask you to describe some of your musical projects and we'll get to the most current ones, but I also wanted to ask about some of your longstanding work with certain groups. So could you explain a little about the Always Folk Ensemble, for example? Oh yeah, yeah. I actually, that's my uh, very earlier uh, project, but it's still now, still work now. Yeah. Um, I started this project since I was in graduate school back to 2008 actually we went went for a national competition with uh, with an ensemble and we won that competition so after that I was thinking uh, maybe we should um, keep going on working on practicing traditional music we should um, became a group and pay more attention on 
on the researching of traditional music. So we, so I, I gathered my uh, peers, my classmates, and and said, "We sh- let's do it." And I, I named the band with Always Folk Ensemble. Actually, in in Chinese, uh, we have a Chinese name can be literally translated to um, walking music, something walking music. So mm-hmm. uh, that means we we want to keep going on that road, uh, studying music. But one of my American friends helped me to to um, to make this English name, Always Folk. And uh, uh, yeah, so we, we did several concerts uh, in 2012, back to that year, and mm-hmm. that was very successful. And we got a lot of inspiration from our um, professors, former professors, and uh, our peers. We we thought we should extend this project and do more research, both in silk and bamboo music, Nanyan music, uh, music from the northern country, northern city, actually, uh, and some Cantonese music as well. So we focus on this four main field of traditional Chinese music. After I moved to States, uh, I didn't think, I don't think we should stop, even though everybody was worrying about my, my left. So, yeah. <laughs> so I just um, keep uh, organizing my band online, virtually actually. <laughs> and they did really good in the past few years. And we just got a huge project signed with the local theater in China uh, to promote traditional music to young kids. Uh, last year, actually. All right, congratulations. Okay. And I think it's neat the way the two names of the group interact because, you know, the Chinese name of, of walking music suggests progression and change, but oh, it's always folk, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so so the, the, two, uh, the, the two names together tell you a lot about the, about the sort of approach of the group. So yeah, exactly. very, very interesting, yeah. So another project that I was excited to see about on your website was your collaboration with Kathy Fink and Marcy Markser. Um, how did that come about? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Kathy and Marcy, uh, I met uh, these two fantastic ladies uh, in Strasbourg Music Center back mm-hmm. to 2017. I was... Uh, the artist in residence of Strasbourg that year, and Kathy was my advisor, and, and Marcy was one of the mentors of that year. Uh, one day, Kathy invited me to their house to jam with them. That was my first time jamming with local musicians, with folk musicians, and that was also my first time to improvise music. That means nothing be prepared, I was super nervous because <laughs> what's going on in, in their house? So we just started to play. I remember my mentor, Seth Kaibo, was there too. Mm-hmm. So four of us just jam. I I didn't understand what, what does the word jam mean, actually. But after that, everything was clear. <laughs> but you don't need to explain to me. I think that's the magic of music as in a language to, commu- to connect to each other. And I was falling in love with old time music. Kathy and Marcy taught me a lot of old time tune and Marcy taught me uh, actually my first American Hammer Dulcimer tune, mm-hmm. grand- Grandfather's Waltz, I think, yeah, mm-hmm. on, on her dulcimer. And we started to jam more and once we went to Library of Congress, attended a jam session for Kumbaya. That time right. was was also my uh, a very important moment for my jam experience, <laughs> my jam history. So, um, and la- last year, Kathy called me and said we should um, set up our project from China to Appalachia. We should like pay more attention on that. I thought, okay, so I will invited to attend one show in North Carolina um, this March, actually. So we played a very successful concert there. Mm-hmm. We, we, com- we played some couple of old time tunes and uh, Kathy and Marcy sing some 
Chinese folk songs. Great. And I <laughs> sung a song as well. I even sung a harmony with them. Even though I made I made a lot of mistake. I <laughs> that was my first time singing on the stage. So that pro program um uh, make me realize how how close the folk music uh, are between US and China. Mm -hmm. Some of them sound similar to me. Some of them are also pentatonic scale. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we can just make the two styles of music work together smoothly. I think it's a good model to uh, arouse people's attention to use music creates more um, efficacious conversation, mm -hmm. more more than just fight, just argue with each other. <laughs> Even though I know um, the cultures from West and East are very different. Yeah. So maybe I I hope this project can be um, can can be uh, approached more in the future and can. Yeah, there are Great. so many things are waiting for us to develop. Yeah, to bring us together. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, you know, you mentioned the the summer jam here at the library in 2018. So we held that old time music jam, and Kathy and Marcy were there, and Chow, you were there, and um, we don't normally record those jams because we want people to be very comfortable playing, you know, and they don't have to worry about the re recording. But we did record that one song, Kumbaya, because we had a podcast that we were going to do on that song. And so in that Folk Life Today podcast about Kumbaya, I just want to tell the audience, you can hear Chow playing along with Kathy and Marcy and a group of other old time musicians. So if you go on the Library of Congress website and you look for the Kumbaya podcast, you can actually hear that jam uh, that, that Chow is talking about. And I guess bringing that up, um, there were two two things that kind of come up. One, you mentioned your um, your Strathmore residency, and I think that was an important moment for you. Also, can can you talk a little bit about the residency at Strathmore, the artist in residence program there? Yeah, definitely. I I was like super lucky that year. Uh, actually, when I moved to the states, I didn't bring my instrument with me. I thought I. I might. I was planning actually back to campus, back to school, uh, for pursuing a PhD degree in uh, ethnomusicology. Mm -hmm. But uh, the year right, the, the year I I did that application, my mom visited me and she brought my instrument, mm -hmm. my instrument here, and said, "How you really shouldn't stop. You should keep going." So. I saw the information of the Strathmore Air program at the very last minute and I applied and I got the audition opportunity and I got into this program. I was um, excited about everything happened in this program, especially the language parts, mm -hmm. because <laughs> I, I barely speak English by that time, but my director, Betty Scott, Mm -hmm. uh, helped me a lot. I people just people from Strasbourg just trusted me, gave me a lot of encouragement. I I took I, I remembered 15 seminars in different kind of arts topics. They offered um, different topics like arts management, how you do PR thing, how you uh, how how to do the tax uh, right. tax <laughs> thing, how to um, promote yourself, how to contact with the agency, such things. Just, I, I feel like I was good. Again, like I get more knowledge, more than I learned from the college. All is very um, pra practical. Mm -hmm. And I think I started my music career. I really started my music career through this program problem in this country. So I really appreciate that experience. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, one of your mentors was Seth Keibel. Yeah. Um, very different kind of music. We've also had him in, in our series. Um, so explain how you worked with Seth. Seth was very um, humor-driven, smart, yeah. and talented artist. 
I remember our first meeting, like a mentor and mentee meeting were uh, at Starbucks actually, <laughs> uh, with my broken language. But <laughs> sides were, were very patient to um, try to understand every word from me and try to um, figure out what, what is chi this Chinese girl want to do. And we collaborated at a senior center. We played, I played uh, my first uh, plasma music with Sai. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Sai tried some Chinese folk songs as well. So that was a very sweet experience with my mentor. And um, he's a good supporter, both on real life and Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Always give me, yes. give me like for my post. It's just super nice. <laughs> Great. And so bringing that up, um, I can also ask a little about your participation in our archive challenge in 2019. Yeah. Um, so the archive challenge is a series where musicians learn pieces from the American Folklife Center archives and then perform them live. And Seth has done that for us, but, but Chow also has. So what sources did you draw on from the American Folklife Center archive to play? Oh, but at that time, I, I, I still remember that was a super hot day. Yeah. <laughs> Temperatures was high. And um, I went to the library and uh, I, I did some research actually before, but I found some archive in uh, Guqin music. It's very uh, classic ancient Chinese instrument uh, with seven strings. Mm -hmm. So I was, I'm a, big fan of Guqin music. I will, if I got a second chance, I might become a Guqin player. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I I found some very good uh, music of, of, of Guqin in that at Library of Congress, uh, played by Jia Bu Xi, the, the, the master of Guqin. So the, the music is, is uh, Pu An Zhou, it's a very classic one. And I arranged it into a very different version and played with my collaborator Tom Teasley at the mm. final concert. Um, Tom played some jazz feeling, add some jazz feeling to this piece, which I really like. Uh, and I picked some original melody, but also uh, did a lot of variation based on the original tune. Uh, that was one of the music. Another two I remember was uh, were nursery rhymes that mm -hmm. I found uh, in at the library congress. Um, those are very famous tune. I I listened to since I was a kid, baby. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really interesting to find those uh, audio sung by foreigner by american but <laughs> yeah. in chinese and those are very like old audio versions so those are very you know it's so interesting to me to hear the sounds from history yeah and some of i don't know one of them i still remember is it's a little little mouse something mm -hmm. yeah the mouse song i even don't know there is a melody for that song so actually, I learned the the nursery rhyme from my parents, but I learned the melody from an American. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's very interesting <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, you found some really remarkable things in the archive, and it was great to have you play them in the Archive Challenge concert. That's also on the Library of Congress website, so people can find that and and watch that video. So. Um, You've mentioned uh, you mentioned your collaborator Tom Teasley, who was there with you at that concert and worked mm -hmm. with you. Um, and you've worked more extensively with Tom since then as well. Um, so talk about your um, your collaborations with Tom and the Dong Shi project, if you would. Yeah, uh, Tom and I uh, also met through a Strathmore program. Tom was the mentor uh, of. The year before me, actually, uh, and I saw one of the Tom's video play on Darbuka drum uh, on Facebook, and I was fascinated about his technique, his musicality. So I was trying to contact him, and uh, under some help uh, of the other mentors, 
we will be connected and we will both notice our uh, home is very well, very close, just five minutes driving. <laughs> so, so I invited Tom to play at um, at my final concert of Strasmore. We started to collaborate together. Um, initially, I gave Tom some of my uh, music, like sheet music, mm -hmm. to ask him to accompany or collaborate with me. But Tom suggested, Chow, you know why? Maybe you should try just to uh, play freely, just try to improvise. I took that suggestion and I think I fall into that um, from then till now. And mm -hmm. once you get into the door of improvisation, you never come back. And <laughs> yes. And so basically this collaboration is based on improvisation, but gradually we, we both noticed under the improvisation parts, there are something more profound that urged us to develop together, which is to create a music dialogue, to make a connection between US and China, to make a bridge. Because uh, if people said music is a universal language, we, we speak different music language, but we can communicate smoothly. We don't need to fight each other. <laughs> and yeah, and also another side of our um, collaboration is we both think um, besides improvisation part, besides this conversation uh, thing, there are more artistic level of, of this collaboration that we could explore together. Uh, that can be taken back to the former topic, the synesthesia, mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. the arts in interaction between a uh, visual be between your, um, your your five senses, human five, five uh, human senses. So we we play together a lot, and normally we just start to play with a simple keyword sometimes. We try to uh, just freely play and to see what's going to happen between these two different musicians speaking different language. And I think it works. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's some wonderful material that you've recorded also with Tom. Um, so, yeah, so there's a lot out there for people to explore. Also, you're famous. I, you know, I live in Tacoma Park and uh, I was walking down the street the other day and there's a bus shelter that has uh, ads for some of the upcoming arts performances and you and Tom, your picture is on yeah. the bus shelter in my hometown. So <laughs> so that's very nice to see you're, you're out and performing as well. Thank you. So, so another project um, that you're, that you're working on recently is, um, is one called Unheard Sounds. Um, explain what that project is about, if you would. Okay, so on her sound, it's an uh, experimental cross-disciplinary collaboration uh, project that I developed during the pandemic. I actually uh, used this project applied for the Next Loop program uh, of uh, the Clarice Smith Center and like and Joe's Movement Imperial. So. Um, on her sound, it's, it's originally named in Chinese. Uh, it's very, uh, it's longer sentence actually from the famous Chinese ancient philosophy book, Tao Te Ching. It mm -hmm. says the great music um, seems only few notes. Uh, the great mm -hmm. form of picture seems no picture. So I would love to use this sentence to for my project that is longer. So I just change it to unheard sounds. Some sounds that people never heard, some sounds that people ignored. Um, yeah, just I I started to develop a solo on my Chinese dulcimer, both uh, on the techniques and mm -hmm. the sounds textures. And also I extended the collaboration that I did with Tom, also with another collaborator, Xu Zheng He. Uh, she is a dancing artist uh, in DC, in Virginia actually. Uh, this project is focused on develop 
the self-expression of immigrant artists. And talking about music language again, if there is a music language universally, mm -hmm. there must be some music language accent and dialect. I, I came to this country with my own music dialect, which people may maybe understand, but not every words. Mm -hmm. So through a communication, a conversation, music conversation with different collaborators, I hope improvisation can help me to reshape a new accent, musical accent, to let people hear every word from me. Even though my English language is not perfectly, it's, it's not perfect, my vocabulary, my grammar can mess up everything, but <laughs> musically, I think people can easily understand what I'm going to say, what I'm going to express. So this is Unheard Sounds' main purpose. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, your English is also very good, so no <laughs> one's going to be too confused <laughs> about what you're saying in words either. Uh, so yeah, it's very, uh, it's always impressive to talk to people from all over the world and and how good a lot of people are, are get at English. But you're, you're uh, even since I've known you, your English has gotten a lot better. So you're wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so so um, I guess you've talked a lot about improvisation and um, and you've made this wonderful uh, concert video for us, which has improvisation in it, but also some traditional elements. So explain how you approached that for us, if you could. Yeah, um, you know, since I, I come from Beijing, that was my whole hometown, right? Uh, I was thinking the title, Homegrown Concert, it mm. must be some, something from your hometown. So what's the sound sounds like in Beijing? I was thinking about that. Um, so I did some research and I, I I found my former um, textbook, <laughs> did some <laughs> research. So the, the music from Beijing, you know, um, belongs to the northern music category of China, which traditionally includes folk songs, nursery rhymes, folk ballad, mm -hmm. storytelling in Beijing dialect with drum accompaniment. That's very special traditional way. And uh, most famously, Beijing opera. Right. <laughs> And also, since Beijing became a um, cosmopolitan city in, in the past decades, I think there must be some new sounds, like a fusion sounds, a fusion of West and East. So, so that's why there were two fully improvisation tunes. Uh, one is called Cafe at the Forbidden City. Another mm -hmm. one is called Hutong Fantasy. So we combined, we used the way that Tom and I used to work together uh, to create these two pieces. But also yeah. I put some traditional elements inside because uh, for example, Hutong Fantasy, I used uh, a uh, typical traditional melodic, melodic mode called Old Ba Ban. Mm -hmm. And I extended that melody for the piece Hutong Fantasy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, and, and also uh, the first song uh, was the nursery rhyme, I remember. It's called Song of Snails. That one was very interesting. So uh, I knew this song since I was a baby. This is mm -hmm. the most popular rhymes, rhyme that parents sing to their kids. Mm -hmm. Most versions come up with two lyrics. Snail, snail, you, you first show out your horns, then your head. Your father and mother will buy for you some roasted food. <laughs> I, I, I think the snail represents kids, and mm -hmm. song, the song tells the love from parents, right? But the interesting is, here they mention the roasted food that the parents bought. I have no idea about what kind of roasted food <laughs> in this song, actually. Because I only familiar, I'm only familiar with the the sounds, you know, mm -hmm. my my mother's son, I too, but I never noticed the, the meaning of the lyrics until last year. I taught this song at a summer camp to local kids, 
and I was trying to figure out the lyrics. Then I knew the food that they are going to feed the snail are liver and mutton. So they're meat. Why? Why you feed a snail with meat? So I, <laughs> so I was super like confused about that. I found a book called Pekingese Rhymes, written by the Chinese secretary to the Italian legation, Baron mm -hmm. Vitali, I think the name is. In 1896, it was the first collection and edition of Beijing rhymes with notes and a, and translation. But unfortunately, there unfortunately there is no explanation of each song. <laughs> Later, I found an online resource, an article about the the long history of Beijing restaurant. There is a long established restaurant sells roast food which was famous for its taste and rich nutrition back to the, the old time. That a nursery rhyme was passed down in old Beijing about, about it, which is the snail song. Interesting. So I, I, I assume that the parents just want to give the best food to their kids. So people yeah, sing the, the liver and mutton mm -hmm. as the lyrics in that song. And it's interesting because some of the parents who sing the song may not even know that history. Right, right. right. Because it, yeah, <laughs> but it persists in, in tradition. So, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's really that's a wonderful piece. And, and so is the rest of the concert. It's just a, a, a joy to, you know, to hear not only what you've done with your own improvisations, but how you've taken these traditional pieces and, and worked on them a little bit to make something new. Um, so. Thank you so much for for the concert. I wonder if there are any of your other musical projects that you want to tell people about. Yeah, uh, last year actually I got another uh, grant support. I now I'm studying uh, with Karen Ashbrook, American Hammer oh, Dawson musician, uh, under the support from Maryland Arts Council. Uh, the tradition, the folklore apprenticeship program. So I'm studying American Hammer Dawson repertoire and uh, music with Karen now. Uh, I'm just sitting in front of my big uh, dusty string <laughs> Hammer Dawson. Nice. So, so that is uh, one of my main um, project in in this past year and this year as well. Um, yeah, that's that's. Just fabulous. We went to uh, West Virginia visit Nick Clinton, the Dulcimer dealer. Mm -hmm. uh, and Nick gave me a very uh, attractive introduction about how people uh, view Dulcimer, how, what is the history of the Hammer Dulcimer. And I also found the book, uh, Hammer Dulcimer a History Online. And I read that book and it helped me to understand the history of the the Dossimer, the Hammer Dossimer actually. Mm -hmm. And even much better than I than I learned from the college, because uh, you know, the best way to learn folk music is from folks. So yeah. I think yeah, it's a very special experience for me. And what are you working on with Karen? I mean, what are the are you working on American tunes or as yeah. uh, is so it's you're so you're learning um, American traditional music on the Hammer Dulcimer. Yes, yes, that's the purpose of this program. <laughs> Excellent, um, yeah. and that'll just—I mean, I'm sure that you'll find ways to improvise with that and to blend it with some of your Chinese traditions as well. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. So another way to bring us all together. Well. Uh, Chao, I just want to thank you again for doing this interview and for doing the concert for us. It's always wonderful to see you, and it's great to hear about all the projects you're involved in um, and to learn more about them. So thank you so much once again. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.